we're going to start reading from verse 5. If you're using a church Bible, you find this on page 1162. And if you need a Bible there, plenty on the table at the back. We just read from John chapter 3. And Jesus is laying out this incredible gospel, this free offer of salvation and grace, which is made open to us. But Paul is now talking about how we as Christians, how we as people who, who have been saved, need to live in light of this salvation that we've been given. Last week we thought about the way he tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. There's a, a responsibility for us to, to live and work in a way that reflects this love that God's poured into our lives. And so you bear that in mind as, as the context of what we're reading here. From verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. You turn back with me then to Philippians chapter 2. Just looking at three verses, verse 14, 15 and 16. If you haven't got a Bible, do grab one off the back. You want to you see where I'm speaking to you from and follow this in the text. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run the labour for nothing. How do you tell if something's valuable? There's a number of ways you can, you can look at it. Is this thing beautiful? Or diamonds are, are incredibly valuable, but the, the most expensive ones are, are flawless and perfectly cut. Is it beautiful? But not all valuable things are beautiful. Gold is, is ugly when it comes out of the ground. But you know it's valuable because it's heavy. It's weighty, that's how panning works. All of the silk gets washed away and the weight of the ore keeps it in the pan. Now the Bible has many, many ways of describing Christians. We're saints, brethren, believers, God's elect and beloved people. But verse 15 has two especially valuable titles. One is weighty, one is beautiful. First one is children of God. You see that there in verse 15. Children of God without fault. It's this remarkable truth that in the grace of God you're not just saved and you're not just justified and you're not just redeemed. But the, the crown jewel of God's salvation work is that you are adopted. You're made a part of 
of God's family in this room this evening are people who God, in all seriousness, considers his family, his children. Tramps that, that were begging at the gate of the king have been made princes to sit at the king's table. Here's what Jim Packer says about the weightiness of that title. He says, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he doesn't understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctively Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. Pack is saying this is something to think about seriously. Go home and meditate on who you are as a child of God. The second title is Shining Stars, in which you shine like stars in the universe. The people that God calls stars are not actors, they're not pop idols, they're not the sports heroes that we admire. His children. So here this evening are a little gathering, a little constellation of God's stars in the world. Now doesn't it move you, Christian, that God speaks about you like that? That he calls you a star. What's more beautiful than a star? You say, well, doubtful sound has a, a peaceful majesty. And, and Mount Cook has this, this breathtaking grandeur. But what compares to the, the furious radiant splendor of a star. So you go to Milford Sound now and you look up at Mitre Peak, you're not going to be impressed. It'll be a grey silhouette against the night sky, but all around it perforating the, the blackness, a million stars light up the darkness of space. You say, ah, oh, but Milford beats it at midday, or no, it doesn't. Because the only reason you can see Milford at all is because a star is bathing half of our globe in its light. So two titles. One speaks of royalty and importance. It's weighty. And the other one is beautiful. It insists on brightness and contrast to everything around it. I wonder if you remember a few weeks ago I told you a story about the Queen Mother giving advice to the royal princesses as they went to a party. Remember what she said? She said to them, royal children, royal manners. That was her advice. God has made us his children. And we must learn to behave like royal children. He's made us stars. And now we need to learn to shine his light. This happens as we saw in verse 12 and 13 by God working in us and us working our salvation out with seriousness. Us working and matching our will and our actions to Christ's. Because Jesus is our great example. He's always been God the Son. He is the bright morning star. He's our aim and our goal. But to become a star, you need an agent. Someone who's working for you, who wants to see you shine. Look at what Paul says in verse 16. In order that I may boast, all these things, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ, that I did not run or labor for nothing. Paul's saying that, that his joy is wrapped up in our success in achieving this, that we're, we're linked with him. And so everything that he's writing here is to help you blaze for Jesus. And he tells us that there are two things that we can do. I want you to imagine, to stretch the illustration a bit as we're thinking about light, imagine the Christian is a lighthouse. And the first thing that we can do to help the light shine is to clean the windows. Anything that stops light getting out, we get rid of it. 
And so Paul says, verse 14, no complaining. Do everything without complaining or arguing. There's two kinds of complaining there. And the first is, a, is an outward complaining, uh, a grumbling to others. It's when you're saying, oh, I don't think much of the way that she's dressed. Uh, I don't really like the way that they choose those hymns and, and the way that the sermon's presented. I'm not happy with the way those people are late every week. They're always the last ones to arrive. It's not the way to shine. And Paul's not condemning discernment here. He's not saying that you, you never question anything that's happening in church. But he's saying if there's something you disagree with, you don't grumble. You don't talk about the person behind their back, but you talk to them. And if you can't talk to them, you talk to the elders. But first you take Jesus' warning seriously and you examine your own life. You make sure that there's not a log in your eye as you go to pick the speck out of your brother's. Now the second type of complaining, it says in our text, it's, it's arguing. And, and the word here suggests an ongoing internal dialogue. It's constantly questioning things, internal complaining, a lack of contentment. Nothing seems to match up to your standard. You can't seem to, to settle in a church. You, you found one, but you're always on alert and you're always listening out for some key words. That are things that you disagree with. Those Christians have a very particular way of doing things. And even though they find a place where Jesus is preached and loved. It's not long before their views on baptism or worship or prophecy drive them away. Then there are Christians who never complain about church. But they're always moaning about their circumstances. Perhaps it's the milk price. <coughs> if you do that, how can you claim to believe that God is truly good and truly in control? You can't hold those two things and complain at the same time. You can't believe God's word that he's working all things to the good of those he loves. And moan and complain. Those two things don't go together. Doubting and grumbling deny that. So none of it says Paul. No complaining inside or outside. That's not how royal children behave. This is not how stars shine. And this surprises us, doesn't it? For some of us, perhaps it hits us a bit like a rock in the face because we don't think grumbling is really that bad. It's one of those kind of respected sins that we don't really hear preached about very often and we certainly don't talk about we might even admire a man who can pick all the faults out of a service and out of a sermon. Let me tell you a story. There was a cowboy driving down a gravel road and he had his dog on the back of his ute and his horse was in a float behind and he lost control of the car and crashed. And a policeman arrived on the scene and he saw the horse was badly hurt. And being an animal lover, he didn't want it to suffer, so he pulled out his pistol and shot it. And he walked around the side of the, the ute and found the dog with four broken legs, so he shot it. And he carried on walking around and found the cowboy lying on the side of the road with multiple fractures and cuts. And he said, are you okay? And the cowboy looked at the smoking pistol and said, never been better. <laughs> Our problem with complaining is that we've lost sight of the smoking pistol. Grumbling is a Christian killer just like any other sin, is a Christian killer. It leads to bitterness and discontent, unbelief, lovelessness, disobedience. It's so dangerous. Paul picks it out here as the one thing stopping you shining for Christ. You see, we shine best when we're most like the Lord Jesus. And you think about his example. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. That's who we're to be like. So you, you pray for help. You pray for Holy Spirit help. But there's another thing that you can do. Something practical you can do to kill grumbling. 
and you might not like it, but it's you need to get involved in church. If you're grumbling about church, you need to get involved in church. You see, Spurgeon tells another story about a man on an ox cart. And the road he was on was bumpy and he started to complain. He was bouncing around. He said, oh, this is awful. And then one of the oxen turned around and said, what are you complaining at? You're just sat up there. You're along for the ride. We're the ones doing all the work. We should be complaining, not you. Spurgeon says that those who complain first in our churches often have the least to do. The gift of grumbling is largely dispensed among those who have no other talents or who keep what they have wrapped up in a napkin. You see, it's much easier to complain when you're just along the ride, along for the ride. There's so many ways for you to be involved here, so many opportunities to, to serve and help the church. You come, come and pull, be involved. There's so many ways for you to serve your king. So you think back to our Christian as a lighthouse and we're cleaning the windows. But now I want you to think that this lighthouse is powered by a bicycle. We clean the windows so that the light can get out unhindered and then we pedal. We, we work to give power to the bulb so that it can stream across the sky. And our agent Paul identifies three areas for us to work in. Verse 15. So that you might become blameless and pure Children of God without fault. Christian, you're to be blameless. This is about your appearance to others. You're to live in a way so that those around you have no true ground to blame or criticise. And that word true is important because people are always going to criticise if you follow the Lord Jesus. But you don't give them any other reason to criticise other than the Lord Jesus. So there are no true grounds to blame or criticise. You've got to be careful in your conversation, the way that you, you treat your family, the way you do business and spend your free time. We're working so that every corner of our life matches up to Christ's blameless life. Then Paul says you're to be pure. And now we're looking on the inside and we're thinking about what Peter says when he quotes the words of God from the Old Testament. Be holy. Because I am holy. That's the rule for royal children. Be like Dad. Be pure in your thoughts and your emotions. Have clean desires, clean passion, a clean will. As, as I said, I was in Gore this morning and you walk in the door and there's a verse on a chalkboard at the side and I won't test anybody and ask them what it is. I'm sure you all know it off by heart, but it's... To Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, I read these words to you. Listen to what it says. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's the way we live. To be pure. Seizing our will. Taking it captive. Grabbing those thoughts. Bending them to Christ's rule. Thirdly, Paul says you're to be without Fault. And the language here is a, a pure gold or a, a faultless diamond without any impurity. Our royal brother, the Lord Jesus, tells us exactly how flawless he means when he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Listen to those words blameless, pure, perfect. Aren't these? devastating command. Isn't God asking us to pedal too hard? Surely these things are impossible. And yes, with man it is. But we're not working alone. We have the Holy Spirit to strengthen, help and guide as we work out our salvation. And God works in us with resurrection power. One day He will complete this salvation. One day you will be utterly blameless, pure, and without fault. That is what he's accomplishing in your life. But for now, that's also what you're aiming for. There's no other standard given for Christian living. No other goal. In every area, in every way, be 
like God. We shall invest when the windows are clean and sin is removed and we're peddling far, striving towards Christ-likeness. The last thing I want to say is that stars must shine in the world. Verse 15. You may be pure, be, sorry, blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. You see, many Christians see the standard that God lays out for our life and they say, I need to cut myself off. If I'm going to do this, I need to be completely as far away as I can be from any distraction or unhelpful temptation. I need to build my lighthouse far away from the salty air and the waves and the seagulls that mess up the windows. But what use is a lighthouse if it's not by the sea? We're to be a light in a crooked and depraved generation. It's not good hiding your Christianity until Sunday when all the stars come out. You're to shine in the world for the world. You think about what stars do. Stars guide. For, for centuries, men have used stars to navigate the world. And, and the world needs stars. Sinners need to be pointed towards the cross and the Lord Jesus who can save them from hell. Because without stars, without someone to point them, how are they ever going to find safety? Small is the gate. And narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And far fewer will find it if there's no stars pointing the way. Then stars are trapped. There's not a single one of you who on a, a clear night like tonight hasn't looked up and said, wow. Stars dazzle us. And that's how it's to be with you, Christian. You must be different from the world so that people say, wow, what's happening there? There's something about the family next door. They've got a, a confidence and a, a joy that I don't have. Stars puzzle. See, stars have always perplexed men. We, we find them enthralling. We know so little about them. And so you shine. And make people question, why? Why are you living this way? Why do you go to church? Why do you come twice? Why don't you have the same priorities that I have? I met a lady this week who nurses dying people. She said to me, there's such a difference between Christians when they're dying and everyone else. Do you hear, do you hear what she's saying? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. What's going on there? What's this difference between these people and everyone else? You're to be a star in a broken world, illuminating the darkness, drawing people to Jesus. Verse 16 says, holding out the word of life. You see, the, the brightness is in our lives, but we didn't put it there. We didn't start the fire. We certainly can't make it burn in your heart. God used his word to save us from hell. And so we hold it out to you this evening. This same gospel message, we pray that his spirit will challenge and change you tonight. Because although stars may guide, it's Jesus who rescues. Stars attract, but Jesus satisfies and fulfills. Stars puzzle, but Jesus answers. It's Jesus you need. Don't you want to be a star too? Why don't you leave the darkness of the crooked, twisted world that you live in and the crooked, twisted way that you're living? Repent. Believe on Jesus Christ who forgive you all your sins. He give you his perfect life and make you a star to shine for him forever. And just by saying two simple things. The first thing is a warning. Because not all stars are stars. On Tuesday night, the brightest star in the sky was Jupiter. It's not a star at all. Some people are like that. They look like a star. They come to church. They spend their time with Christians. They read the Bible. They listen to sermons. They think, I must be a Christian. 
but they're not. There's no light really burning inside. They're not a star at all, just a religious rock reflecting some of Christ's light. So I invite you to ask a critical question this evening. Am I really saved? If Jesus returned now, would I be certain of heaven? A religious person won't ask that question. Not seriously. Because they're happy with their own good doing. They're content with themselves. And on the day of judgment, they will be left entirely to themselves, facing a holy God. And then, too late, you will see how far short of his standard you fall. Am I really saved? A Christian will ask that question. Because you can't bear the thought of not being with your Lord Jesus forever. You can't bear the thought of being in hell forever. You will ask that question and you won't be content until you know the answer. The last thing I have for you is an incentive. An incentive to really shine before men in your actions and words. It's a verse I must have read a number of times from the book of Daniel and never really picked up on Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13 says this. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever.